evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Fort Lee Public Library is proud to present tonight, Changing the World, One Click at a Time, Teen Activism in the Social Media Age. My name is Jackie Lou Rea. I am proud to be your moderator tonight. I am the president of Alexina Consulting, and uh, this is our third uh, community chat, which I just love being a part of, and we're so pleased to have our distinguished panelists here with us tonight. So thank you all panelists and thank you all our, to our audience for joining us tonight. Um, just a couple of housekeeping rules for tonight. Um, so respect and professionalism always throughout the entirety of this um, it should be always period, right? Uh, but you will be able audience to uh, type any questions or comments in the chat. So please feel free to do that. You will be off camera and also muted for the duration of the program tonight. Uh, but any comments, we will be happy to um, uh, read it in the chat. Also, uh, just to let everyone know, we are recording the session. So if uh, you have issues with that, um, I apologize for that, but we are recording. So please um, take that into account as we proceed and we are recording right now. So only the panelists will have audio and video and myself included. So, and then let's see, we covered um, the questions. We covered uh, welcome, we covered being kind to each other. So I think that we, um, actually one thing that we didn't do is thank Fort Lee uh, Public Library, the Board of Trustees. I see that Paige Sultano is on with us, their president. So Paige, thank you and the rest of your colleagues on the board for making this evening possible. Um, it has been an interesting year plus for all of us, and I, am, I know I'm very, very interested in knowing that, um, knowing what our teens, uh, young adults, uh, what their thoughts are on what, uh, on the state of affairs and how we go about being effective activists during this time with social media. So I'm just going to go through the names and just acknowledge all of our panelists right now. So we have Kata Flowers, Lorelei Hoje, Tiffany Kim, Caitlin Lee, Rosanna Lopez, and Noah O. Oh. So at this time, I would very much like to call on each individual one and uh, please introduce yourselves to our audience. So Kata, would you like to go first? Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Kata Flowers. I'm a senior at Fort Lee High School, where I'm the vice president of the African American Club. I am on this panel today because I'm a strong advocate of combating society's diversion surrounding topics like race, gender, equality, and I also do, do like social media. So incorporating both of these things that I'm passionate about and being able to talk about how social media can help advocate these important things was a great opportunity to involve myself in. Perfect, Kata, thank you so much. Lorelei. Uh, excuse me. Hi, my name is Lorelei Hoje. I'm uh, also a senior at Fort Lee High School. I am the director of the Coalition for Justice for Breonna Taylor and the legislative strategist for the Campaign for No Knock Warrants. Um, I'm here today just to share the role that social media had in the work that I'm proud of. Laurel, I thank you so very much. And I apologize for the little mispronunciation of your name initially. So thank you so much. Tiffany, how about you? Um, hello, my name is Tiffany Kim. I am a junior at the Fort Lee High School. I am the president of the Fort Lee High School Asian Club and the vice president of the Youth Council in Fort Lee. And I'm here today so I can spread awareness and also open a platform for discussion to discuss um, current events, especially how social media plays a role in activism today. Excellent, Tiffany, thank you so much. Caitlin. 
Hi, I'm Caitlin Lee. I'm a sophomore at Fort Lee High School, a member of the African American Club and Student Council, and I'm the creator of the Intro to Public Speaking course for children at the library and the Young Writers and Read for Change Club. I'm here today because I really believe in change through education, so I want to show my community just some insight into what local teens are doing for activism. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Caitlin. Rosanna, how about you? Hi, my name is Rosanna Lopez. Um, I'm also a senior at Fort Lee High School, and um, I'm the co-founder and president of PRISM, which is Fort Lee High School's Gender and Sexuality Alliance. And um, I'm here today because of my belief in intersectional advocacy, especially amongst teens um, on social media. Um, though I mainly use my platform to share information about the LGBTQ community. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, Rosanna. And Noah, how about you? So hi and good evening. Um, my name is Noah O and I'm currently a sophomore attending Fordley High School and I'm a member of various school clubs, including the Flint Warren Club. So um, I'm not a leader of any organization or club, but the reason I'm here is because as someone who has witnessed and um, experienced many things that are pressing society today, I try my best to stay active with and up to date with all the latest news and issues. So I'm glad to take any opportunity to help whatever I can to support activism. All right. Well, thank you so much. Welcome, everyone. And I must say, you are an impressive group of young adults. Absolutely. And I thank you all. Um, for your leadership and your, you're all leaders being uh, with us here tonight to share your knowledge with us and your experiences. So let us get started. Okay. And I will repeat the question for you so that you hear it and our audience hears it. So question number one, how have you personally or with your organization used social media to engage in activism and which platforms do you believe are the most effective? So again, how have you personally or with your organization used social media to engage in activism and which platforms do you believe are the most effective? So again, panelists, you can take about an, a minute and a half or so for your responses. So please take your time and share your information with us. So Kata, I'm gonna go to you first, please. Um, okay, so personally I've used social media for activism, but like first like changing my profile picture on TikTok to support Black, the Black Lives Matter cause and um, I've also posted about issues in society such as inequality regarding race, gender, sexual identity, things to spread awareness on, as well as looking up information on local protests or rally that are around me so I can be informed and attend and encourage others to attend as well. Um, I've also signed and passed on petitions for others to sign on social media that have benefited, such as the Justice for George Floyd petition. Um, one of the main reasons why I joined the African American Club actually was to like take a part in a group that cares about the same things as I do, such as diversity and inequality and inclusion. Um, for me, the most of effective social media platforms are Instagram and TikTok because those two apps are the ones where like 95% of the time I'll be informed of some sort of injustice that I never knew about. So I could post on for my followers so they can also be informed. All right. Excellent, Kata. Thank you so much. Lorelai, how about you? So um, I was able to build a racial justice coalition with Change and AdQuick um, uh, with this kind of alliance of different nonprofit organizations. Um, I started the petition for justice for Breonna Taylor, which now sits at around 12 million signatures. Uh, the petition called for a ban on no-knock warrants, which we are continuing to promote today. Using the momentum from this petition, we also built from scratch a call tool that allowed constituents to call um, elected officials directly. We saw just shy of 100,000 calls from all 50 states using this call tool. Uh, we raised and donated around $5 million to Black-led organizations. 
Um, we also started a campaign which raised around $80,000 in crowdfunding with 2,000 different contributors um, from all 50 states. Um, the very special thing about my personal, my personal relationship with social media is that none of that would have been possible without the presence of a lot of the social media platforms that we used. Um, and because of the momentum of social media and people that use social media, we were actually able to get No Knock Warrens banned in six different states. We were also able to use this momentum to make uh, Rand Paul, the Senator of Kentucky, um, introduce federal legislation to also ban no-knock warrants. And um, we are hoping to continue to push that legislation um, in Congress and continue to use social media to promote this cause. Well, <laughs> that's really all I can say with the two respondents so far. Our panelists are some powerhouses for sure. So, and we've only gone gotten to two of them. So let's go on to Tiffany, how about you? Um, so definitely I've used social media to engage in activism. So when it comes to the Youth Council of Fort, we often use our Instagram platform to spread awareness about events that we have. And these events um, focus around current events. So we have, um, we've had events about comfort women, which were the um, sexual slaves of um, Imperial Japan. We've also had conversations about race as well. But personally, I've engaged in social media activism through Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter the most. And I've actually heard about um, Lorelai's um, petition for Bianca Taylor through Instagram and TikTok. And with social media, I believe that information spreads like wildfire because um, the rate at which information is spread, and I feel like a lot of people are able to hear about issues and especially personal testimonials from people who've been involved in these issues much quicker and much more efficiently than any news media or outlet would be able to cover. And I feel like with these personal testimonials, the information is raw and um, those who are involved in social media activism can hear firsthand how these issues are for minorities and educate themselves and spread awareness by sharing these stories on their social media platforms. Excellent. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, Caitlin, how about you? So for me, I've personally been using my social media, like my Instagram specifically, to bring awareness to things and I'm reposting like informative info threads on my stories. Um, and like I've seen that, like by doing that, I feel like there have become a few like faces of the movement like you everyone knows like you know George Floyd Breonna Taylor and there's also just so many people whose names we don't know but they still need so much justice so I try to repost um, and post things that maybe people don't know about that are like lesser known but they still need a lot of justice so I try to do that um, as for platforms I feel like each platform is so effective like for many different things um, like Twitter I'll usually go to Twitter if like I see some like breaking news and I just want to hear like the discussion on it what people are talking about like just to hear like if I don't even know what's going on I'm going to find it on Twitter um for Instagram I usually use that to see what my peers are thinking because like majority of our classmates are on Instagram and I'm going to find like informative threads like clear explained like typed out things by like organizations um TikTok is kind of like Twitter but I feel like it's more casual because there's so many more young users and I just find I go to TikTok as a place for more casual like convos about race. Okay, casual convos about race. <laughs> All right, that's that's very very interesting. Rosanna, how about you? Um, yeah, so uh, I began prison with a friend of mine uh, the summer prior to our senior year. Before we ever had meetings for prison, we decided that we wanted to focus not only on community engagement and volunteerism, but on advocacy for um, LGBTQ issues and current events. So we made an Instagram page. Um, so there we mainly focus on reposting information and news that's relevant to the LGBTQ community. But we also wanted to focus um, on being an intersectional organization. So while we do post um, information on Instagram for um, national LGBTQ days um, or holidays like Trans Visibility Day, um, Day of Silence, 
Um, we, we are also active on, um, you know, in other months like Black History Month, Latinx History Month, um, and so on, because, you know, we do believe in spreading a message of interconnectedness, um, especially amongst underrepresented communities. Um, but most of all, we're a community organization, so we also promote local events on our Instagram, like the most recent local protest, which was the Youth Council Stop Asian Hate March, um, and even events like these um, by the Fort Lee Public Library. Um, and I think ultimately our philosophy is think globally, act locally, which is why we like to focus on community engagement like that. So of course, um, you know, we post information that informs people about issues on a global and local scale. Um, and we like to especially use platforms like Instagram because it's easy to repost information um, and see what people on a global and local scale are thinking and feeling and saying. Rosanna, thank you so much. You know, and listening to all of you, and Noah, I'm going to call on you next. It, it is the um, most amazing thing to me, first of all, the reach that you all have, but the instantaneous reach that you not only can learn things, but that you can share things as well. So Noah, how about you? All right, so um, I first started social media in seventh grade, which was a year after I got my cell phone. And um, at the time I mostly avoided like Snapchat and Musical.ly cause I associated with like the hooligans or like the um, kids that always fool around. And I was also like really worried about privacy concerns. I've always heard of news networks, but I didn't think of using social media to promote activism or anything until I joined the multicultural club at my school. And we began protesting activists, I mean, promoting activist events at the and And um, I think we garnered at least like 40 students with just the first event, just through um, promoting on social media. So that's when I first realized like, dang, this actually works. So um, in eighth grade, I moved to another school and they were already like, promoting things with social media goes to show how ubiquitous it is. And they're even using like, um, not just Instagram and Snapchat, but also Facebook, which I just thought was for old people, but I guess not. So um, at the, and by the time I left that school, I think I ended up sharing so many posts and used so, um, used so many posts to like retain information that I feel like it even replaced my calendar at some point. And of course at Forley High School, um, Social media is also used to promote activism, obviously. And I bet even this was, um, a lot of people here probably heard about this event from social media. So. so from my experience, I think Instagram and Facebook are among the most important because they endure because the posts that are uploaded there last until basically when someone takes it down. So, and, and recently TikTok has also been used, used a lot for activism. I mean, it's not surprising considering how much, how easily the dances there go viral. So of course, activism would be the same. Very, very interesting. No, I'm going to have to uh, ask you to elaborate on something. And um, I think it's important because you're not alone in your comment with, with Facebook is, in that it is for older folks, right? And it's not a bad thing. It truly is a real perception and in a lot of cases, a reality. How did you realize that it was actually an effective um, platform? Um, pretty much just experience. Like um, I didn't really use Facebook before. So I guess it was kind of unfair of me to make a judgment about it before I actually like start using it a lot. Okay. But yeah, that's, yeah, that's basically pretty much how I found it. So did you find that, that your colleagues, your peers were actually using Facebook? Oh yeah, I, I thought that was really weird at the time, but I got used to it then. <laughs> okay, all right, excellent. You guys are just amazing. I don't even know how you find time to go to school, quite honestly, <laughs> with, and keep up with your studies because each and every one of you are just so involved with um, activism. And I know the name of the game is that you have to, when you're using social media, you have to stay on top of it, right? You can't just post something and then walk away because you're, you're, that's why you're doing it is you're waiting for responses. And um, yeah, it, it's just incredible. Okay. Question number two. 
How do you determine what organizations and people to follow for issues that are important to you? And what are your most important factors in establishing trust and credibility? So I'm gonna repeat that again. How do you determine what organizations and people to follow for issues that are important to you? And what are, what are your most important factors in establishing trust and credibility? And Noah, I'm gonna start with you. All right, so um, to jump right in, I first wanna start by like mentioning how easily false information is spread. For like, like, for example, Facebook, maybe not as much as now because the problem was addressed, but they used to allow like the transmission of false information without verification. And there's also sensational journalism, like all those, you won't believe blah, blah, blah ads that you always see. And um, so one way to determine like what organizations to follow, like instead of those fraudulent ones is, for example, when I log into Instagram, I always see people's stories like linking to threads about news or issues. So one of the first things I do is usually to check the comments of those and to see if like there's any claims against its validity and also check like what um, critics have to say about it, even if I disagree with their viewpoint. And then once I do that, I search the story on my own and get try to get my own facts. And I see if who was like telling the truth, like the posts or the comments. And from continued experience, I both get to know what organizations to trust based on like the amount of um, false posts they have. And also which peers I can trust to like um, spread the right information because that's where they're getting their information from. So um, regarding establishing trust and credibility, I think integrity is probably the most important because almost no one regains trust after lying, even after a long period of time. So, um, and integrity inherently means honesty. So that's where credibility comes in. Um, and yeah, so like mendacious, like lying organizations aren't worth listening to for news and issues and as well as biased and emotional sources. So, um, so yeah. All right, excellent, Noah, thank you. Rosanna, how about you? Um, I think for me, it's really important to, for people to follow organizations that are actually out there doing the work, whether that's by encouraging young people to be active, um, to do real actions like writing to the representatives and are actually protecting whichever communities they represent, whether that's through fundraising or different events. Um, for example, I think that Glisten is a really great account for young LGBTQ people to follow because they publish real data that's from their national LGBTQ youth survey every single year. Um, <clears throat> they also hold um, events for students that are inclusive and intersectional. They post biographies about LGBTQ figures, and ultimately they're a very holistic um, organization that focuses on real work and real people and real stories. I think that's a lot more effective than, um, you know, reposting an account that reposts infographics because like Noah said, um, there is false information on the internet. And I think that if that's the case, then it's really important for people to be able to verify that information. But, you know, I think that's why focusing on, you know, following real people, real accounts that are behind the movement is really important, um, you know, in supporting different communities. All right, thank you so much, Rosanna. Caitlin, how about you? So I specialize like in like racial equity and yes, intersectionality, but really like in racial equity, like that aspect of it. Um, so for me, what I, I'm just in generally looking for is to follow more content creators that are people of color, specifically black and indigenous. Um, like when we're talking about these issues, they're the people who are being so directly um, affected by this. So I find that like their information, their experiences are going to outweigh maybe the research of another person. So I just wanna get the information directly, no, no middleman. I wanna get it from the people who are experiencing it, who know what's it, what it's like and what they want to happen, what change they want. Um, and like kind of a question that I might even like pose to the audience is like, just maybe go through and see who's running the accounts that um, you follow, the organizations, do you know? 
um, like there was kind of like not a scandal, but like something that came out that there's a popular, a really popular Instagram page called Feminist. And it found out that there were two white men running it. So the, people were kind of surprised by that, especially since they kind of made it seem like they were women that were running it. So it was like for women, by women, but it was two men. So, I mean, it's since been replaced by two black women, but that's just an example of, do you know who you're getting your information from? So if you do find yourself, maybe you're following more like white activists, that's fine. I mean, everyone can be an activist, but I would really question like that maybe you want to get the information just from the people who are affected by it and just have that credibility of their identity. Um, as far as how I can establish trust, um, I guess, do you accept criticism? If someone, if like maybe someone says something and people like in the comments are out disagreeing, like this was not like, this wasn't it, this wasn't right. Um, are they gonna be really willing to be like, okay, I'm sorry, I realized that that was wrong. Or are they gonna kind of avoid it, fight back? Do they accept the criticism like that the public is telling them is what I look for. All right, I like that, okay. So somewhat of accountability of, of actions is, is critical. All right, thanks so much, Caitlin. Uh, Tiffany, how about you? Um, so I feel like navigating social media activism is definitely super tricky because everyone's behind a screen and sometimes you don't even know who's running these accounts. So I was actually about to dump what Caitlin just brought up about the feminist account. And I believe um, the change account on Instagram also faced a similar issue where the account or the company was founded to profit. So um, this ties into how I check for credibility and trust when it comes to social media activism. If you went to their website, the first thing you'd see automatically was their merch store or like, you know, their t-shirts, their cups, whatever. And automatically that's a red flag because if you're trying to participate in activism and to spread awareness, making money or profiting off of these issues is not something that you should be doing or something that you should try to utilize which in a sense is really exploitative of the issues that are going on, especially the people in those communities. And I really think that it's important that um, activists, especially white activists or people who are not um, black or indigenous use their platforms to amplify rather than um, speak over. Because I feel like a lot of the issues that come with TikTok and Instagram activism is that so many white activists, especially speak over black activists and black people or indigenous people on these social media platforms and that models the information that should be spread and it's um it covers the information that should be um spread like i said before and it essentially um glorifies white activism and makes it so that you can only really get information from these white activists so i think an important thing when it comes to trust and credibility of these activists is to see their activity in their history. So what have they done so far other than to just speak on social media? Because spreading information on social media is definitely important, but what are you doing past that performative sort of activism? Because if all you're doing is spreading information on social media and you're not having discussions with people you know in real life, you're not donating, you're not signing petitions, then are you really an activist? Are you just spreading this information because you want to look good or are you spreading this information because you think it's an important issue to talk about? And um, definitely, I think when it comes to bigger corporations, check their liability and their accountability. Just like Caitlin said, if accounts or people have made mistakes, which is definitely um, um, a possible thing to happen because there's no such thing as a perfect activist and activism is something that you make mistakes and you learn from and you gain experience. And when you make those mistakes or when people make those mistakes, how have they um, how have they learned from it? Do they deny everything that people are telling them? Do they um, ignore the backlash or do they try to learn from it? So I think definitely to um, kind of encompass what you said, see who runs these accounts and if they're from the communities that they're trying to spread awareness for. So for example, if you're trying to learn about the Stop Asian Hate Movement, are you learning from an Asian activist or are you learning from a white activist? Are you learning from a black activist when it comes to Black Lives Matter or are you listening to a white activist or a non-black activist? And um, also definitely make sure what they do in terms of their activity past social media and to see how they've responded to backlash or um, calls for accountability. All right. So again, uh, resonating with all of our respondents so far is is personal testimony, living the experience that you're 
you're being the activist on, right? And, and personal accountability for actions, errors, or maybe good things that have happened, but to be to hold yourself accountable. Thank you so much. Lorelai, how about you? Uh, before I start, I just want to make sure that the audience knows I worked with change.org. The change that Tiffany was referring to is essentially a, a clothing line, which is spelled C-H-N-G-E. There are two different changes. I just want to make sure that that's clear. Um, uh, for me, um, I think that using social media platforms for information is all about using it with purpose. Because if I'm if I'm looking for an opinion, then I go deliberately look for an op-ed or an editorial. If I'm looking for information though, without bias, then at that point I deliberately avoid uh, social media accounts that aren't accredited news organizations. Um, if I want to spread information or action items, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, those are great platforms. But if I'm trying to learn information and absorb information personally, I avoid all of those apps. Um, actually, currently, I don't have Instagram on my phone. I don't have Snapchat on my phone. I don't have TikTok on my phone right now. Because ultimately, and you know, maybe a little different from the thought of the other panelists, we have, in a way, gone from the information age to the disinformation age. Um, for me, I don't read infographics that are not from news organizations. Because the thing about, for instance, Instagram infographics is that that information is meant to be put into kind of a cute you know, visually pleasing kind of bubble that's meant to be digestible, but the trade-off for that is context. So when people put these large amounts of information that require nuance and require context into these very small things that are meant to be digestible for an audience, you do trade a lot of nuance and extra information that I personally think is um, integral to, you know, being well-informed. Um, with that as well, I also follow the Center for Humane Technology, which essentially is an organization that kind of shows you how to be, um, I guess, a citizen of the internet in an ethical way and to know where to get your news that isn't trying to sway you one way or another. Personally, I don't follow Fox News. I don't follow MSNBC. I don't follow Breitbart. I don't follow CNN. I prefer Pew Research Center, the Equal Justice Initiative, Associated Press. Reuters, um, even the Atlantic, the New York Times, the Washington Post. Um, but, you know, for me, it's important, very important that I have information that isn't meant to be manipulative. Um, and it's for that reason that I don't repost infographics and I don't read them because I want my information to be coming from a source that isn't there to almost fool you. Um, and also, when I do read news articles, I read it from top to bottom. Um, there was a study recently that showed that a lot of people in this age tend to do kind of a, a flick through. Um, most people don't read from top to bottom. A lot of people just read the headline. And, you know, that is problematic because headlines are not meant to inform you. They're meant to get your attention so that you'll read the rest of the article. But when you skip the rest of the article, you're missing the nuance, you're missing the context, you're missing the information that you need to be well informed and at least for me and a lot of you know people that I worked with we were working with politicians and staffers and congressional representatives and so it was it would have almost been dangerous if we had been armed with information that wasn't as close to the truth as was possible um so you know I think you need to know what your purpose is you know if I'm trying to spread information again I think that you know a lot of these social media platforms are great because it gets a lot it gets a lot of information to a lot of people in a very short amount of time. But if you're looking for information personally to educate yourself, I think you need to be really careful about where you're looking and how you're looking and how you're reading it. Well, um, Laura, so what I'm hearing from all of you is that you are in a, almost a constant state of research and fact checking and that's how you build that's how you build your your trust and and know where to go. Kata, what about you? Yeah, like for me like it's basically the same everyone pretty much said what I wanted to say. So, I don't want to repeat anything, but um for me like um when I stumble upon like an organi organization or like I want to educate myself on a topic, like I'll go to like the source, like I'll check um, like their past, um, like anything in their past, like how they respond to um, how people like come, um, like talk to them. 
or like interact with them or like just anything like that because you don't know who's behind um, the account that you're on. So it's important to, you know, find like the credibility behind that. So, yeah. All right. Yep. Research, testimony, accountability just resonates with, with all of our panelists tonight. Thank you. Uh, but, you know, what I loved is, uh, Noah, you had mentioned this and certainly everyone um, repeated it in their own way. It's integrity and honesty. Right? That, that is two of the most important things. That's how you determine who you follow and, and what platforms, right? So thank you so very much. Uh, so question number three, how do you determine the pros and cons of different social media platforms and how do you measure success or impact? Okay, so again, how do you determine the pros and cons of different social media platforms and how do you measure success or impact? And Kate, I'm gonna start with you. Um, well, for me, the pros of different social media platforms is that if there are many people who use a platform because there are various types of people, many of them being like the ones who will help with like advocating things. Um, another pro is if the apps have ability to post and have access to like photos and videos because not everyone is like a tactile or like reading learner, but some there are people that are more of like visual and hearing learners. So the access to like many, any forms of activism, whether it's like an article or a video, like if they include everything can help a broader range of people be informed successfully. Um, like for example, I don't think like um, plat platforms like Reddit would be like a really um, stable platform for activism because it's mostly like a small group of like people and like on, they only really include like written questions, statements and responses. But I feel like TikTok is like the opposite of that because it gives videos, it gives articles um, and there's like various people on it with different opinions and different mindsets. Um, I feel like the cons of different social media apps and like platforms for activism are like if the platform isn't popular enough or doesn't have like a broad range of people who are willing to be open-minded and listen or spread awareness or if just like if the platform isn't made for like any types of posts like like apps like Wattpad and like LinkedIn well, I don't think would be the best place for like activism really those are like the cons because although they're popular they're like for like specifically uses like reading a fiction book or trying to find a job okay yeah definitely so again research on different kinds of platforms to to utilize the ones that are that will be most effective for you but katie you know i have to mention that i loved how you opened um with the different kinds of learners that is that is one of the most inclusive statements that you could make and so i really appreciate that that you, know, you have to gear, if you want to get your message out, you have to gear it to different kinds of people who learn and absorb information in different ways. So thank you so much. Caitlin, what about you? So we've all seen those posts, like those viral posts on everyone's stories. Maybe it's an infographic, maybe it's some video, like, like that same post, like on everyone's stories. And I feel like this can go both ways. I feel like for pros, like, um, like, you know, when you're just going through your Instagram story, sometimes you'll just skip someone's like, we're always just skipping through. So we're just not going to read that let's move on. But if we see that people keep posting this exact same thing, you see that same icon over and over, it might make you feel like, okay, I need to check this out. I'm going to click on it and get informed. Um, so I feel like that's a pro, but um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, so, but also a con could be maybe people could just be tired of seeing the same thing over and over again. And um, like I mentioned earlier, I try to bring in like different things and different um, things that need recognition that people haven't learned about yet. So I try to post new things. And the way I see that that reaches people is if they're maybe also repost on their story. So it starts like the chain reaction or see that they liked the post that I reposted that I knew no one else like probably knew about already. 
Um, and then also getting into just a major con that has been become increasingly aware, I've been increasingly aware of is click baiting with people's lives. So for the past few months, you know, I'm Asian. So I've been seeing all that stuff about the anti-Asian hate crimes going on. And like, it was literally, like, I couldn't even be on social. I wasn't even on social media, but like when I was like, I would just see videos, pictures of people being beat up, bruises, like all this bloody, disgusting stuff. And I feel like people have good intentions. They want to tell people about it and say like, um, we need to bring awareness to this, but this is where we get into like the performative activism, the not considering other people that we were talking about earlier with Tiffany, with the um, white activists is that the reason I was stressing the importance of having these, um, following these creators that are the minority that are the ones being impacted is that when you're getting your um, information, following people that are not impacted for them, like a white activist might repost a video of like some um, Asian person like getting beat up be like this is horrible we need to do something about this and I get that the good intention behind that but what are we receiving from that the impact of that is that you see that that needs recognition people need to know about that I see someone who looks like my grandma getting beat up that's not something that I would want to see and I feel like with since social media has become just with a touch of a finger that can be a blessing and a curse it's so easy to just post something without any accountability and people um have been just getting away with that and it's like the way Instagram stories um have been designed is that you just click through click through click through it's like oh you're gonna see like someone reposted a celebrity's kid, like Kylie Jenner's baby. And then the next one, you're going to see someone being beat up. And then you're supposed to just move on and keep going. Like, that's just not how it works. And like the way that like psychologically messes with a person of color's brain, like I can't even imagine how um, Black people have been like going through that throughout the whole summer. Um, now just experiencing that, it's been horrible. So, um, oh, sorry, I have a motion sensor light in my room. Um, <laughs> So <laughs> welcome to our virtual world. It's yeah. all good. <laughs> um, so, uh oh, I think I forgot where I was. Um, where was I? I was talking about how like, yeah, so it's just you need to be more aware of that and just following the people, like I said, that are being impacted. Um, that's definitely, definitely a major concern that's been coming up especially because of the rise of just people being interested in activism, which is great, but then not doing the work behind it. Like Lorelai said, not really reading the actual text, just seeing the headline being like, this is bad, we need to repost that and not getting the full picture behind it. And this is where we lead to things like not being, like not considering like how people will receive it, which is like most important because that's what you're trying to do. So yes. So Caitlin, I just have to ask you, so this, I think this is where your light started to flicker. So I think this is, I just wanted to clarify. So when you talk about um, like Instagram and, and, and going through and you see, um, you know, the story of the baby, and then you see someone getting beat up, are you saying that some of the platforms tend to wash away the importance of the messaging that an activist or someone who is trying to talk about something very important? Is that what you were getting at? Is that it yeah. just kind of get washes everything out? Yeah, like since it's just so easy to post, it's like this is something that is not normal to see someone like with all this horrible things like on their face and like just graphic, graphic videos. It's not something that we're supposed to be accustomed to seeing, but we've been desensitized to it because it's just everywhere. And that's not normal. Like we need to understand that that's not okay, that it, we find it normal to just regularly see um those kinds of things in our feed every day and we need to be more sensitive I feel like people have been like always they just take something and then they twist it and make it take it of its original meaning and like that's what people have been doing they don't understand the impact behind what they're doing so all right Caitlin thank you so very much Lorelai how about you um I mean, we talk about the pros and cons of social media. I mean, I'm going to be a college student. I mean, I would say Instagram and Snapchat are the two most prevalent apps that we use to connect to each other and make friends. And for that purpose, I think social media is great. 
um, I occasionally re-download, you know, my social media so I can follow people and meet new people. Um, but then we get to the darker side of getting information from social media. Um, one thing that I'm very wary of is desensitization, kind of like what Caitlin said. And in addition to that, I think a lot of people end up in an echo chamber. Um, I think I'm very politically minded. And so, you know, regardless of my own political views, I think what we can all agree is that what we see in our Congress today is gridlock. And a lot of that is because I think a lot of constituents are stuck in an echo chamber. I think a lot of people have misconceptions about how the algorithms of social media platforms are built. The algorithms are meant to keep you there. They want your attention because they profit from your attention. I mean, they sell advertise, they sell you to advertisers, they sell your attention to advertisers. So the purpose of social media platforms is to keep you there. That is their business model. And so they're going to show you more of what you like because if they show you what you don't like, you're not gonna stay. And so when you show that you lean to the left or when you show that you lean to the right, they're gonna show you more of that content. And you will never even know that there is an entire world out there beyond just what you think. And because you're stuck in that situation, you say, oh, I have all these facts. Everyone has all these facts because everyone whose content is being shown to you agrees with you. Um, but that's just not the case. And then what happens? We have gridlock and nothing happens and nothing gets passed. And essentially, that is what occurs. Uh, so for me, I think that, you know, one of the cons of social media is that a lot of people aren't privy to that or don't um, consider that when they're scrolling, which is why, you know, I think it's really important to scroll mindfully and to always be aware that, you know, regardless of what your feed shows, there is an entire world out there outside of just what you think. I mean, personally for me, I was working with staunch conservatives in Kentucky and it was almost a wake up call because I have lived in the Northeast, the liberal Northeast for my entire life. Um, and so working with those types of people showed me that there is just, there is an entire world out there regardless of what you see on your social media. And I think a lot of people don't, don't see that. Um, and when I talk about measuring the success of engagement for me personally, um, I measure success of my posts into how they translate into real life actions. I think a lot of people throw around the term spreading awareness nowadays, and that's great. That's a good thing. But spreading awareness is only so effective because, I mean, when you spread awareness, everyone might know, but it doesn't matter if nothing actually gets done about it. So for me, I always include when it's something that has to do with policy, something that has an action item in those posts that says, here's a link to a call tool, make a call, or here's a link to an email template make an email. And then, and then, you know, obviously they have an analytics, an analytics team at change and add quick. And, you know, you can kind of measure how many people are actually doing those things. And so in my view, I mean, for a post to be effective, it has to result in a physical action taken in the real world, because I mean, just spreading awareness because of the fact that honestly, all social media is built to be an echo chamber, not because it's malicious, but because that's the business model that post is only going to get to people that agree with you and the people that it has to get to will never see it. So I think that when we talk about social media, we have to be aware of the fact of what it is, what it was built to do, the fact that it wasn't built to distribute information or to inform the public. That's not the business model of Facebook, of Twitter, of Instagram. Um, and we do need to be mindful of, of the fact that this is an echo chamber and that when we see things that cause outrage, we can't just be outraged. It has to turn into a tangible action. Um, and kind of like what Caitlin said, we need to be aware of desensitization and burnout. Um, personally, I felt burnt out a lot these past few months because you would see incidences of violence over and over and over again. And I think for a lot of activists, everyone on this panel, that was exhausting. And at times it did make me feel very discouraged. Um, and so I think these are all things we have to keep in mind when we use social media for purposes that aren't you know, networking or making new friends. All right. Thank you so much, Lorelai. Uh, so just I'd want to just uh, insert a little public service message here for our audience. Again, uh, please utilize the chat uh, for any comments or questions. And for for the panel, I just want to say that uh, we have a very nice audience here today. We will try to get to as many of the questions as we can, but we can't promise to get to all of them because this certainly is some very compelling conversation, but just continue to um, post in the chat and we will get to the questions during the Q&A. So um, Noah, how about you? 
All right. So um, first of all, I want to say that I feel like determining how easily info can be spread on social media can be both good and bad. Like, for example, like as everyone else said, like um, in Instagram and other apps can let you easily link to like um, infographics and other information about recent news and stuff. But because of that convenience, a lot of people can get complacent and they're often not compelled to like look further into it besides what they see on the posts. And they just want to keep continuing like looking on and on like what they came for, like sports pages or like um, whatever vacation their friends are going on or something like that. So um, so there's that. But at the same time, like if info, if information can't be spread easily, like if you just, if you're only able to like put screenshots, it's really hard to like track the sources of the information you get unless you like actually read into it. And again, that's, again, like with convenience, a lot of people aren't willing to take that extra step to like look and try to search for themselves or, whatever that screenshot came from and um obviously no social media like actually like limits so um limits to screenshots but just saying like in theory um and i feel like another major con is that a lot of i don't know about anymore but in the past and probably now like a lot of social media apps and other news networks like they condone the spread of like disingenuous or um reactionary info just because they want um your ad revenue and like similar to what others have said like um they only want to show you what you want to see so it's hard to get like a broad perspective of the real world and you only really like encounter people with your viewpoints and that's like that's and obviously if you take any um debate class that's not the point of discourse um so so yeah and um i feel like one one um measure of success or impact is um obviously the tangible effects that it has on like significant figures like big business and government. For example, um, the, the Black Lives Matter movement like made waves last year and um, uh, the NFL, for example, like apologized for, for what happened with Colin Kaepernick in 2016 because of it. And um, the NBA also like, they also promoted the Black Lives Matter movement. Like everyone, every player could like, um, uh, instead of the names they could put like equality or like justice on their as their on their jerseys so so yeah um okay thank you so much noah rosanna how about you um yeah i agree with most if not all of the pros and cons that everyone before me mentioned i think that um, a con that applies to pretty much all social media platforms is that a person or, or an organization can have, you know, pretty much a completely anonymous social media identity. And this can make it really hard um, to verify how beneficial or true, you know, certain information is to you as a reader or an activist or whoever you are on social media. Um, spending a lot of time on social media absorbing information and can make it really difficult for someone to understand that there is a really vast world of information and perspectives that you may not know that extend way beyond social media and its capabilities. And um, like everyone else mentioned that social media truly is an echo chamber of information that the algorithm and these platforms want you to see. Um, but luckily, I think that um, social media can make huge impacts on social movements. Um, like others mentioned before, during the height of the Black Lives Matter movement last year, there were a lot of, you know, petitions and, you know, real ways to make action going around. Um, and I think that that information really did open a lot of people's eyes to, you know, um, real movements. And uh, of course, that is really beneficial to um, a movement and its success. All right, great. Thank you so much, Rosanna. How about you, Tiffany? Um, so like I said before, I think social media and activism can be quite dangerous. So I'll go into the pros first. So obviously, like everyone said already, the um, speed at which information is transferred among like mass groups of people is something that is um, something that is kind of um, unfathomable, especially 
in like a few minutes, like thousands or hundreds of thousands of people can learn or like hear about an issue and spread it to even more people. It's like this domino effect, which can be good in a sense if the information that is being spread is correct and accurate. But at the same time, this ties into the fact that um, if this is misinformation, then misinformation is being spread so quickly without any sort of critical thinking, without any sort of afterthought. So when it comes to social media, I feel like a um, con of social media is that people don't really think when they look at infographics or when they look at what's being talked about on social media, because the level of thoughts that the level of thought that's required to intake or quote unquote understand the things that are being um, conveyed through infographics requires such a small level of thought because infographics are designed for this information to be um, digested in a very easy to understand way. And when it comes to activism and when it comes to current events, that's not how these, and that's not how information such as this should be intake. And you should think about the information that you're being um, given and you should Think about how you are going to act in regards to what you just learned about. And especially on Instagram and TikTok, one of the reasons why I saw a trend of people using um, these events and people using oppression to gain clout or fame. So on TikTok, for example, I would always see this terrible trend of people who claim to be quote unquote activists. And what they would do is post TikToks that would say, share this video if you are against, um, if you are against hate crimes or share this video if you're against um, such and such. The fact is people are blinded and kind of under this illusion that, oh, if I share this video, then I'm automatically an activist. I'm an anti-racist activist. I'm taking action. But the thing is that they don't realize that the only thing that, that they're doing is promoting this account that only um, shoves this harmful narratives towards people who think that they're trying to do good or people who think that they know what they're doing. And I think that is so harmful, especially now when activism is supposed to be used to uplift communities and to um, solve issues that um, are very sensitive and difficult to navigate. People are just shoving this kind of, um, this narrative around where if you just share an infographic or if you just share this TikTok, then you're automatically involved in the um, activism that's needed. You're automatically in the know. But in actuality, all you're doing is performative activism and surface level activism, which I think is the worst thing about social media activism. I see so many people who just post infographics, but when I try to have a conversation about these issues, they just divert the entire conversation and they just say, oh, I already posted this infographic. I already signed this petition. I already did this. Isn't that enough? But the fact is, if you are really going to be an activist, if you really want to be involved in activism in general, you can't just be involved in social media activism. I think social media activism is fine if it's used correctly and you do other things beyond just sharing things or just um, posting things because obviously those are intangible. You can't really get results from just posting a few pixels on your account and you can't really get action through just posting infographics on your Instagram story. The fact is you need to have tangible actions that come from these um, social media activist acts. Um, and the fact is you need to be able to recognize where the line is between performative activism and actually getting yourself involved. But I guess another pro or um, a pro of social media activism is that you can kind of see a tangible reaction when it comes to the public. So especially in the Black Lives Matter movement, there were a lot of people who were speaking up about these issues, especially on their Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, et cetera. And because people were able to speak up with such ease, um, there was a lot more action being taken. Yet at the same time, the discussions that were being held were often surface level, which leads to the problem of surface level activism and performative activism. Um, but yeah, I essentially think that social media activism can have a lot of pros if used correctly and there's action taken beyond that. But if all you're doing is just social media activism and just posting things on your Instagram, posting things on TikTok for the sake of clout, and for the sake of looking good, then I don't really think that you can call yourself an activist. Okay. All right. Yes, Caitlin. So I had to jump in. Like, <laughs> I just thought of some things when we were talking about <clears throat> the echo chambers. And I feel like um, people, even along with these apps trying to cater to us and what they think we want to see, people are also willingly putting themselves in these echo chambers. Like, 
<clears throat> I was seeing people be like, if you support this, unfollow me. And while, okay, like for some people, like that can actually be um, like, that's not like a bad thing to do if like, you're like literally in danger of being like, if you're not, if you're a black person, you're not gonna want to be friends with a white supremacist. Like, I'm not talking about that stuff, but I'm talking about like, if you're a white activist and are being like, if you support Donald Trump, you should unfollow me. Like, I feel like that can be problematic, like, because you are at that place of privilege where you could walk that boundary and be able to have conversations with people who don't believe in the same things as you safely. Um, and, but people aren't willing to do that. They, um, like we said, they are just like listening to what people are saying about all this um, stuff and just putting themselves in this, like, if you don't believe this, this, then, um, and then just don't even interact with me when they could be having those conversations and actually helping people reach the goals and like that they want to get reached. Um, and also with info, so like, we're just able to click it with, you know, test your finger, people get so lazy, like Lorelai was talking about, and they're just willing to believe anything. They don't read um, like the news article top to bottom. Like when, unfortunately, like earlier this year, when Brandon Bernard, who was on the death row, he got um, executed. People like after that whole thing, when that whole thing was happening, um, you know, everyone was posting about it, all this stuff. And, you know, I had like read like what had happened. I was like, okay, I understand like what's going on. Um, but then after the fact and stuff, my, some of my friends were texting me like, wait, I thought he was like totally innocent. Like I thought he didn't do anything at all. I thought he got randomly put on death row. And I was like, what? And then they were like, yeah, on TikTok, people were like this guy, like help this guy. He's innocent. Um, and well, yeah, that's a whole other conversation, but, um, he definitely wasn't randomly put there and people just thought he was chosen to be put like, that's just not how it works. And like, they're willing to accept things that, um, because it fits what they want to believe. And they're, they're not willing to take the context for what it is and work with that. So I, I really ha had to add that in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true statement, Caitlin, um, that people, it, I don't know whether it's a, a, not a laziness, but it's just a widespread acceptance of if this person said it, it's got to be true. Instead of doing the extensive research um, to, to check, to fact check and to um, make sure that the information is credible. So that that is huge. So thank you for adding that in. All right, so question four. In a technology, technologically driven yet highly multi-generational community, what is the best way to share information that impacts us all? So again, in a technologically driven yet highly multi-generational community, what is the best way to share information that impacts us all? And I have to say, this is such a relevant question for our panelists tonight because the, the subject matter that you um, are so involved with, that you have um, chosen to be activists and to advocate uh, affects us all, every single one of them. So I am looking forward to your answer. So Tiffany, how about you? What do you think? Um, so I'm definitely not going to deny the fact that social media is a super important part of our generation, almost the zeitgeist of our generation, um, a zeitgeist, excuse me. And the fact is like social media is super effective when it comes to spreading information to a wide range of people. And that's something that is often taken for granted, I feel like. But in fact, like, like, I, like we've all said before, social media activism is super dangerous at the same time because people can just spread misinformation or just spread false narratives for their own personal gain, which is something that is really dangerous when it comes to activism. So in my opinion, I think the best way to share information that impacts us all, regardless of our age or generation, is through having discussions and conversations. I think that's the first step when it comes to breaking barriers, when it comes to activism, especially for um, the younger generation speaking to older generations. I think having that conversation or that discussion um, to open this platform for people to spread awareness and talk about these issues is something that is super important because that by, by that excuse me that by in itself is taking action. You're taking action to even change one person's perspective or even um, learn from one person. I believe is something um, is a really big step when it comes to activism. And once you've kind of gotten your feet in the water and you've kind of gotten familiar with activism, I think past that, you should start educating yourself and reaching out of your comfort zone when it comes to and taking information. Don't limit yourself to just social media infographics and social media videos. You should actually read 
um, articles, you should read books by people who are familiar with activism um, and read books about anti-racism, read books about um, the history of these movements. So you can educate yourself as to how these movements work and why these movements exist in the first place. Because yes, the um, overall idea of these movements is that um, we need to fight for equity, we need to fight for minorities, but there's a lot more than that because if that's all you're taking in from these social media infographics and these um, the social media activism that we know now today, then you're not really familiar with activism and the reason why these movements exist. And I think it's really important that you know why these movements exist before you really, um, before you really involve yourself in them. And I also think that clearly you should take more act, um, action besides just reading information or having conversations. I think you should definitely try to get involved with local government if you can. And that can be really effective when it comes to spreading information, in my opinion, and um, trying to make changes in your community by having discussions, perhaps in your school. So um, for example, when it comes to my Fort Lee, High, um, Fort Lee High School Asian Club, I try to host discussions about topics that aren't discussed in classes or just in everyday life. So I try to have discussions regarding um, how you can be a better ally to other communities of color or other marginalized communities, how you can be anti-racist or what you can do to um, do X, Y, and Z. And I think that's really important, especially for people who aren't even on social media, because while the majority of Gen Z or millennials are on social media, there's a lot of people who still aren't. And if we're going to rely on social media for activism and information regarding those topics, then you really aren't spreading information at all. You're really just in this bubble of people in or people involved in social media. And I think it's important that we have to expand or we try to expand this information to other groups of people and to exchange information with other groups of people. Tiffany, I so agree with you. Um, the the one-on-one -on -one conversations between individuals to learn about each other because no two people are alike and experiences are different. And that that's what we need to do is learn from each other. So thank you so very much for that. Rosanna, what about you? Um, I think that it's so important to um, engage with people on social media, like everybody said, in interactive ways. And of course, since social media is designed to be interactive and it's designed to allow you to have conversations with people, um, there's a lot of features and things that you can do um, as an individual to share information or to have conversations with others. Um, and like Tiffany said, I think that interactive methods um, of social media are especially interesting when you're learning about you know the history of a cause or the history of an event or um, about a person who started a movement um, you know I, I personally love learning about the history of the communities that I'm a part of or just in general learning about the history and background of different you know, social movements, I think that that's super important, especially for um, this younger generation of activists. Um, but also just in general, I think that posts that lead you directly to different, you know, uh, fundraising campaigns or phone numbers to call or, you know, grassroots organizations and accounts um, are interesting and effective too. Um, ultimately, I think that it's important to really connect with others for a cause because there certainly is power in numbers and knowledge. Excellent, thank you so much, Rosanna. Noah, what about you? Um, so since we're talking about the multi-generational community, one thing I, um, I think is important is that since a lot of older generations tend to be more conservative conservative in values than like the newer generation. Um, I feel like um, you have to remember that it's going to be hard to like get get your ideas and convince them to um, agree with them. So um, I think it's important to remember to always keep a cool head in discourse instead of like just hurling insults at them. Because if you do that, then you're, you're basically like precluding the chances of like actually getting them to listen to you since everyone has a pride. And if you insult them first and then you feel and then and then you prove them wrong even if they feel like you're right they won't want to admit it so there's one thing and another thing i feel like um these days it's unfortunate but no one really goes to the library as much as they used to since there's like so many other distractions and things to do well things they want to do 
Um, so I feel like it's important to um, uh, spread activism in things that people actually are interested in, like especially pop culture. Like these days, um, a lot of movies and media have implemented activism in their work so that more people could like empathize and understand them from like, for example, there was recently there was Mirari that came out last year. And, and I feel like um, one thing we can do as a community is to like promote these movies or like pr promote this music that talks about this so that people who aren't inclined to um, read academic books about by like scholars and like a library would actually like pay attention and understand and try to support these causes. So I think that, yep. All right, great. Thanks, Noah. Lorelai, how about you? Um, I think it's important to be confident in your opinions, um, stand by your beliefs and your principles, but at the same time, have an open mind and be aware of what social media is at its core. Um, I think something that applies to both the older and younger generations is that, you know, when it comes to being well-informed and, you know, funneling passion into action, we have to all do our due diligence and make sure that we all keep in mind that social media is essentially a supplement. It's not a foundation. It should not be your main you know, pathway to resources and information. Um, a lot of the other panelists said it is great for spreading good information to the public. That is very, very true. And it is very effective at that. But I think that when it comes to informing yourself, I think first and foremost, social media has to be a supplement. When it comes to building your base of knowledge, social media should not be like the core of where you're getting your information. Uh, Noah also brought up a really great point, which is essentially that there is no persuasion in hate. Um, I think something that social media has done uh, in modern times, I guess, is cause this divide between you know, the two sides of the political aisle um, and a lot of that is the reason why we have so much gridlock today. Um, but essentially when you're trying to, you know, convince someone that you're right, if you insult their pride, if you insult them personally, there is no persuasion that's gonna happen there. There is no productivity that's gonna happen there. Um, no one is gonna walk away from that conversation as a better, well-informed citizen. Um, at least for us, when it, for me and you know my colleagues at Change and AdQuick while we were trying to get the Justice for Breonna Taylor Act passed, um, we had to make a lot of legislative decisions. Um, one thing that we were wondering was, do we kind of target a Democrat or do we target a Republican? And we were thinking, if we were to ask a Democratic you know, Senator or representative to kind of introduce this legislation, then will the Republicans um, agree and, you know, help us in our cause in getting it through Congress? Or will it be vice versa if we get it done through a Republican? Which honestly, this is, remember, this was police reform. It was, it would have um, um, barred police from ever being able to use a no-knock warrant ever again, essentially. Um, and you would think that you could never, ever, ever get a conservative to sign on to something like this, but look who sponsored it. It was Rand Paul, who I would argue is probably one of the most conservative um, pundits in Congress right now. And it is possible. So I think that when we go on social media and when we participate in discourse, I think we have to also understand that people form opinions based on their own experiences. People form opinions to the best that they can with the knowledge that they've been exposed to. And that's not, that's not standardized. That's gonna be different from person to person. So when we use social media to participate in discourse, I think everyone needs to remember that while it will get heated sometimes, that's inevitable. At the end of the day, I think that, you know, all constituents who are, um, you know, aware enough to engage in those kinds of conversations have the best of this country in mind. And that is something that you have in common. And so I think that when you're asking someone to agree with you, and, you know, like Noah said, I think it's really, really important to remember that, again, there is no persuasion in hate. Um, and like I said before, social media, for me at least, is a supplement. Um, and I never use it as a foundation. And I think that these are things that can apply to both the older and younger generations. Excellent. Thank you, Lorelai. What about Caitlin? The best way to share information that impacts us is any way you know how. I feel like in, um, like we find in history, like when 
you try to suppress a group of people, they just bounce back more and higher. Like you really can't stop people from, you know, doing um, the things they're passionate about that they're meant to do and like have even developed like, you know, new genres of music or art. And I feel like throughout this whole year, there's been such um, a creative flow going through people because they're so passionate about these stuff. Um, I've just seen so much um, amazing things like graphic design, spoken word, poetry, um, dance, painting, art, music, even people who play sports, like taking a knee or dedicating a certain game to something. I feel like any way that you know how, like not how you know how, you should be dedicating that to your activism. It doesn't have to be something that you've never done or you don't know how to do. Like you can of course do that, but um, implementing that activism into your daily things that you do is very practical for everyone. All right, great. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Kata. Um, yeah, so I would say like the best way to share information that impacts everyone, um, like if we're talking about social media, like sharing impact as infographics on social media, but um, like Tiffany was talking about earlier, like don't like check first to see if like you're spreading misinformation, because that could be like very dangerous to like, um, think you want like want to advocate for something, but you're actually spreading wrong information. So um, yeah, just make sure you check um, the credibility of everything before you post it, um, you know, and reposting like an informational video from like someone else's page or just you just you just speaking on like an important topic you care about, like going live on Instagram or whatever. Um, but at the same time, like, um, it shouldn't be like the social media shouldn't be the only thing that you're using to advocate like what Lorelai said, like um, yeah, if you're just sitting behind a screen, like a computer or phone and just, that's the only way you advocate, you're not going to protest, you're not um, trying to influence and have like conversations with people like in real life, if you're not um, going to like the direct source, like um, it, it's like more like performative activism, which um, is not that helpful. So, okay. All right, Kayla, thank you. So, so those were the four formalized questions that I had prepared for our panel panelists today. And I will tell you that the chat is very busy panelists um, and with lots of kudos with some wildly impressive audience members on uh, not only your, um, your demeanor, but your knowledge and your I, just the uh, absolute maturity of you all. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, and, and this is an important question, I'm going to take a couple of the questions, kind of blend it all together and use that to, to close our session today because we don't want to keep everyone um, over time. But I do want to say, I'm going to ask this question, but before I do that, I would like to uh, let everyone know that there will be a um, a questionnaire after at the conclusion of the session today, and it will be posted on Zoom. So if, if um, all the attendees today could take some time just to fill out that questionnaire, we'd really appreciate it. Okay, so here's the question that I have hybrided together. That's, that's a word I just made up. <laughs> so, um, and I would really like for everyone to, to answer this. So, um, who inspires you? And do you see yourselves continuing this, um, your, all your activism activities after you leave high school? And I know some are closer to graduation than others, but so let's just say in the, in the future, do you, can, do you think that you're going to consider this? So, um, Kata, I'm gonna start with you. Who inspires you and are you gonna continue your work after, after into the future? Um, well, like some people that ex, um, inspire me are um, like groups like um, like change, like the people that are a part of it. Like um, they inspire me because they built like this whole company um, just to like spread awareness and to help with people and 
um, impact people's lives and, you know, just help with that. Um, and for after like I graduate, because I'm a senior now, so I'll be graduating soon. Um, I was thinking of joining like a few clubs at the college that I'll be attending um, that will help. Um, that will, and yeah, that will help and like spread awareness and so I could advocate like what I'm doing with the African American Club. All right, excellent. Well, congratulations to you. Graduation is coming up and definitely you don't want to lose your voice just because you're going to, to college. So we wish you a great deal of luck, Kada. Lorelai, how about you? Um, well, to answer your first question, I mean, besides role models that are kind of further away, like, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and people like that, the two most immediate people that pop into my mind are my parents. Um, they quite literally crossed oceans for me. And um, I think from a very young age, my parents always encouraged me to be very politically active. I think a lot of the reason that I'm so passionate about this is because um, I'm actually half Korean and half Latino. And so I think, you know, I've had certain experiences in my life and I've seen certain things that have made me care about this. And it's really my parents that kind of fostered that passion. Um, I do intend actually on majoring in international affairs and international business in college, which will be actually pretty soon, a couple months from now. So um, yeah, I'm actually going to call, if all goes well, I'm going to college in Washington, DC. And so while I'm there, I'm hoping to be involved with as many opportunities as possible on the Hill and in Congress. And so, yeah, I definitely um, foresee continuing on this path. All right. Excellent. Lorelai, thank you. And good luck to you and continue raising your voice. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Tiffany. Um, definitely. I think people who inspire me are my peers, because I think it's so admirable that from a young age, like especially teenagers, we're able to take a stand in important issues. And I know that it's really difficult to do that, especially now. We're all really busy with school and a lot of us don't really know what we're doing when it comes to activism. But I think the most admirable thing about young people or people our age or my age getting involved with activism is that we're willing to take that first step and we're willing to um, break out of our comfort zone to speak about issues that are important to educate other people about these issues that are important. And um, when it comes to my political activity past high school, I'm right, right now I'm a junior, but um, in college I'm thinking of studying politics or policy making. But if I don't pursue that career for sure, I will continue um, with activism because these issues are never going to go away. They're always going to be a part of American society. They're going to be a part of the world until, or we have to continue to work to um, fight oppression. We have to continue to fight for equity. And I think no matter what kind of career, career excuse me, I pursue, I'll always be involved with activism because especially as an Asian woman, I think it's important that I take a stand in issues that directly involve me and other minorities and marginalized communities. All right, Tiffany, thank you so very much. Glad to hear you're going to continue your work. Caitlin, how about you? Well, I first have to shout out my parents. They have always encouraged me to use my voice to speak up, not let anyone try to shut me down, and to be proud. Not for life again. <laughs> and to be proud of what I have to say to people. Um, as far as like um, my activism, so as a Christian, I find it's really important for me to look up to like those um, leaders. So coming to mind right now are um, two Black um, Christian preachers and theologians, Jackie Hill Perry and Kyle J. Howard, who are um, passionate about God and passionate about social issues. And I love how it kind of works together and how they fight for biblical justice. And that's something that I'm, I'm really passionate about too. So I'm always on their Twitters and stalking them and just looking to see what they're talking about. All right, great. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Rosanna, how about you? Um, I'm especially inspired by um, queer BIPOC creators who share their messages of social justice through art. 
Um, one of my favorite creators to follow on Instagram is um, a woman, her name is Joanna um, Toruño, and she's a queer Salvadoran street artist. Um, and I think as a queer Salvadoran young woman, um, she's especially inspiring to me because of the work that she's been able to do um, people that she's been able to work with and ultimately the way that she shares her messages of empowerment to um, the lgbtq community and young you know bipoc or latinx people like me um i think that i certainly hope to be um, involved in activism and social justice beyond um, high school. Um, I'm also, I'll also be studying um, in DC next year, um, majoring in international affairs. So yeah, I definitely do hope to be um, involved in uh, opportunities um, within the political sphere, especially in DC. And that's something that I'm very excited about. All right, as you should be. Continue your great work, Rosanna. Thank you. All right, Noah, what about you? Um, I feel like two of my biggest inspirations, one are just martyrs in general, anyone that's fought for their cause and risked their life. Like when I was young, I just wanted to have fun, like hang out and stuff. So I could never imagine like risking my life, putting my life on the line just for the sake of pushing um, your beliefs, even if it's at the cost of your life. But eventually, when I eventually after growing up, I realized that it's because of people like that that society has come to this, uh, come to this position it is in today. And if if not for them, then I'll be living a much much worse life with much worse conditions. And my other role models are probably my parents for a similar reason because um, my dad he grew up in he grew up in Texas during the '80s, so he faced a lot of racism. So I feel like in order to um, in order to let me grow up in a safe, safe environment, he, he and my mom both provided a really good household for me and taught me about politics and to get involved. And so I feel like they're kind of the reason I'm built. Um, I was built to be like this today. And of course, for the same reason, I, I don't want to just like um, meander around and like just do nothing when I become like an adult. So hopefully for the rest of my life, I continue to stay involved in activism and do whatever I can to help society change for the better. All right, well, you all, our panelists tonight, every single one of you have absolutely given me great hope for our future because you are all so bright, so eloquent and so driven to, to get things right in our society. Um, and I really, really appreciate you sharing very personal stories with us tonight and your insights and, uh, everything. So I really want to thank you. Um, we so appreciate it. I want to thank the Fort Lee Public Library for making this program um, available and possible because, yeah, sharing, sharing information as we have for the last hour and a half is how we're going to get to fix things and to communicate and be more accepting and, you know, embrace diversity and make sure equity happens and make sure that we're all inclusive. But truly, I would love to thank our audience tonight for joining us. Um, the hour is late. It's nearly 830 at this point, but I am going to ask you again. Sarah will be sharing the link. Um, if you could just click on it and take some time to answer that. I do apologize again for not getting to quite a number of questions. We, we had a significant amount of um, chats that we just don't have the time to. So I'm thinking that we just need to reconvene again very soon. So you guys have not seen the end of me. <laughs> we definitely have more information to share together. But at this time now, I would just like to say thank you to everyone. Thank you for inviting me to share in this very important event tonight. Um, it has been my honor and you all have taught me a lot tonight. Um, so again, thank everybody online and uh, everyone stay safe, stay sane out there and uh, enjoy graduation, enjoy the rest of your high school year. And let's look forward to a very, very bright future. So um, 
you could go ahead and post the link for the survey. And with that, I say, have a great night, everyone. And thanks again. Take care.